Okay, Tevet, can you take, um, I think, while we're waiting for admin, uh, last few people to admit, will you get ready to begin the presentation? Ladies and gentlemen, we just uh, have a lot of admissions we can't take at the moment. So bear with us for a minute and we'll kick off. Good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for the last few students. Afterwards, we will begin. Thank you. Can we just ask the members to mute themselves and also be mindful if you're presenting? I think Haro can see your screen at the moment. Um, we'll just let the Sylvia and Safia team do the presentations today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, third annual uh, South African Renewable Energy Grid Survey uh, results webinar. Um, would like to thank everyone for making the time this afternoon uh, to join in. Uh, it does seem like we are having a bit of technical difficulties to start off with, um, but I'm sure that will be addressed uh, very shortly. Just in the meantime, as we as we get the webinar going, um, we'd just like to run through some uh, basic. Everyone, the first thing to know. It is that the webinar is being recorded. Um, so the webinar is being recorded. Um, so if there are any objections to uh, taking part in the webinar, um, I want to through also if there's any objections to that, um, we will manage the recording. Second, um, if there are any questions, um, please log the Q&A function um, and the Q&A function questions are executed when the Q&A section comes up and then afterwards the um, microphones will be opened uh, to, to be able to verbalize the, the questions. Uh, and then lastly, we've just asked that all attendees uh, please mute them themselves. Um, and uh, after that, um, we will open up the questions, uh, open up the microphones for, for Q&As. Um. Okay. I think we'll kick off now, Devet. Your, your um, sound is a bit cutty on our side, but ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow enthusiasts of the renewable energy industry, good afternoon and welcome to the third annual South African Renewable Energy Grid Survey Results Webinar. My name is Zaid Vauder, the chairperson of the Safia Grid Access Working Group, as well as the renewable energy leader at WSP. 
On behalf of the Safian Grid Access Technical Working Group and SUIA, we are thrilled to see such a diverse audience gathered here today, representing various sectors, whether you're from government agencies, private companies, media, research institutes, or simply passionate about sustainable energy, your presence underscores the importance of our collective efforts in advancing renewable energy in South Africa. Uh, just briefly, let's take a moment to reflect on the survey and the journey so far. Born out of a need for increased industry and ESCOM collaboration in 2022 after a challenging REIPP round five. Over the past three years, this survey has become a crucial platform for dialogue, collaboration, and knowledge sharing. It is where we assess pro progress, identify challenges, and explore opportunities to strengthen grid access in South Africa and guide our colleagues in ESCOM to channel investments strategically through the GCC and TDP. This initiative has become a mainstay for industry who's actively using the data to shape investment, identify new offtake locations, and make strategic moves in the energy space in South Africa. We have received praise as industry for coming together and contributing data and knowledge within a fair and equitable framework in compliance to good data science principles. When benchmarking internationally, the survey team notes that, th that there aren't many comparable surveys internationally, proving once again that South Africans can rally together in a crisis to create world leading solutions to all challenges. I'd like to say a thanks to my working group initiative supporters, including Wayne Smith, Devet Talyad, and Santosh Sukram for helping me with the many hours of hard work required to pull this initiative together. A very special thanks to our CEO, Dr. Reta Vile Malamu, for her unwavering support and dedication to her members and working groups. I'd also like to thank our partners at SAWIA, including Innovation Governor and the Energy Council for their support. Finally, but not least, we'd like to thank ESCOM and their support, uh, especially Ronald Murray, Sanjin Mello Perlin, and Caswell and Global for their great collaboration and the data analysis, as well as making time to present the results to the industry today. As a reminder, the results will be collated and published on the NTCSA's website within the next few days, if not already, but they can also be accessed via the SAFI and SAWIA websites shortly. For those of you who don't remember, the 2024 edition of the grid survey was expanded to include solar, wind, BES, hybrid facilities, gas and hydro projects, but it also informed ESCOM on the status of wheeling offtake points and also tested industry's willingness to participate in ancillary service arrangements if elected to by ESCOM in future. Before we hand over to Ronald for the 2024 results presentation, this initiative will be run annually and the next cycle is anticipated for early 2025. We want to thank everybody who contributed their projects this year and hope that the cooperation continues next year. Without further delay, Ronald will hand over to you, after which I'll facilitate a Q&A session for the, uh, for the for public and in, in ESCOM. Thereafter, we'll do a short closing. Ronald, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the welcome and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we appreciate your attendance as well as your contributions to the survey itself. Um, we do use the survey in our assessments in the TDP and various other assessments and going forward also looking at collector networks or how to streamline the connections onto the grid. So it is a very important um, collaborative exercise and we appreciate your contributions. What you see on the screen now is the results and it's a comparison between the uh, survey from 2023 and 2024. And what you see is, is there's a significant increase in contributions, which was hugely encouraging. And it was across all the various um, associations, off takers, and um, other contributors. So, uh, very well um, uh, contributions from a wide range. And if we look at the capacity that wants to be connected to the grid, it's more than double the indicated capacity from last year's survey of 66 gigawatts uh, last year to now over 100, almost 134 gigawatts, which is a significant increase and gives us great insights to where capacity unlocking needs to be on the grid. So before we get into the actual details, what I just want to provide is some of these definitions. So we classified the projects in these definitions. You, you can go through them in detail, but effectively the type A is projects that have got uh, records of decisions and effectively can roll out within the next three years. Um, type B is projects that are slightly delayed up to about five years. 
Um, they've submitted uh, documentation, but have not necessarily re received full approvals yet. And a type C are projects that are indications of uh, in the early stages of development and insights into five to seven years into the into the future. So those are the the, the types of, of projects which you'll refer to frequently. And then we got two classifications um, installed megawatts HC and contracted. And the installed is the amount of plant installed at a particular site, and it could be a combination of PV, wind, and batteries. But the connected is actually what is the capacity wanting to be connected onto the grid itself. So example is if a facility had 100 megawatts of PV and 50 megawatts of battery, it might only seek to require 20 uh, megawatts of grid capacity. So in this case, the installed is 150, and the uh, connected is is 120. So just to to give clarification of those differences. So if we come if we come here, we can see that the installed capacity um, has significantly increased. Um, uh, there's actually um, it's gone from 93 gigawatts to 172 gigawatts. And the connected capacity, as mentioned, is, is 166 to 134 gigawatts. The battery storage, um, actually, the this is the energy rating, is, is very much the same as last year. But what we see is that the actual capacity of the batteries have significantly increased, uh, which uh, indicates some interesting things around how these batteries are intended to be used and uh, probably require some additional investigation into in, into the batteries utilization. So it looks like a lot bigger batteries, but with the same energy content. Uh, significant increase in, in PV, uh, more than double. Um, and um, in terms of wind, uh, more than a 50% increase. Uh, we had gas. Somebody had a gas one in our last project. No gas this time, and and very uh, a small amount of CSP and a small amount of hydra. Uh, relative, very small compared to the remaining types. In terms of the type A, so the type A again was the um, projects that are ready. Uh, went from 18 to 60 gigawatts of projects that are ready in the next um, three to five three to five years. And the, the type B also has increased to almost 32 gigawatts. And the type C to um, interest into the future of the projects, almost 41 one gigawatts. What we see across all the provinces is there's um, a significant increase across all the provinces, except for the Western Cape. You'll see the Western Cape has dropped slightly from um, about 10 gigawatts down to, to 7.5. Um, and we see that the KZN has dropped from 7.8 to 2.4 gigawatts. So those are the two who have only shown a decline, but significant increase in the Northern Cape, a Hydra, Free State, Northwest, um, Pumalanga, Limpopo, Eastern Cape, and a significant increase in Gauteng, going from uh, less than a gigawatt to 8.8 .8 gigawatts. So um, across the entire board, a, a huge amount of increase um, of plant. The, this then shows the, the distribution over time when the, in, the connected and the installed is required. Um, and we can see that uh, very often these dates are very close to the ends of the new years that are given. So this is 2027. So this could be spill over to the following year. But you can see a large increase um, in, in the projects um, around about 27, 28 uh, with, within these periods. Um, the, and this gives us the installed at the, at the plant itself. So you'll see these are slightly higher than what is required on the grid but also follows a very similar uh, distribution. Um, this is a, a similar view, but it shows then the breakdown as yeah, the timing of the projects and the type of projects. So, so this can break it up down into our PV, um, the volumes that we can see. And I think the interest here is looking at the blended projects. So this is PV and battery. So you can see about 18 gigawatt wants to be connected for PV and battery storage but the installed capacity is almost 40 gigawatts, more than double. Um, 
So uh, a large amount of batteries combined with PV um, and re <clears throat> having a significant reduced amount on the grid um, and almost a consistent amount over time um, with the batteries dominating in the earlier periods and then dropping off into the latter periods um, in the um, in the development. The wind, there's also interesting batteries, um, but the uh, volumes are, are also almost double. Um, and also the interest uh, slightly shifted into 27, 28, and almost a constant amount of um, interesting wind over the period. Mm -hmm. So so these are interactive, and on the website you'll be able to go through um, these interactions, so we won't go through all of them, but you're welcome. Uh, I'll show you how to do that on the website a bit later on. Um, this is the uh, interest in terms of uh, the project status. Uh, so you can either click on this one or, or on a button on the top. So these are type A, and this uh, shows you the distribution of type A. So we got almost 30 gigs of PV, 12 gigs of wind, and then we've got this range of a combination with the wind and PV. Um, so it's so around about 14, 15 gigawatts of uh, uh, PV, wind and batteries uh, locked in together. Um, and then uh, batteries about a thousand on its own and a combination about a thousand for PV and wind and then the small amounts. So a large amount of of PV and wind and um, blended within in the years that are, are, are coming through. Uh, type B, um, 31 gigawatts, still dominated by PV, um, uh, a wind about 4,700 4, uh, megawatts, and then a combination of wind and batteries uh, coming into place um, into the latter years. And then Type C, uh, we see wind picking up in the Type C. So in the latter parts, there's a lot more development in the wind compared to the PV that's dropped off slightly and still interest in battery combinations between the two as, as time moves on. So we can see the uh, greater interest in wind over the latter periods, but still batteries uh, are, are, part of the, are, are part of the mix. And this provides us a view of those different types um, across the uh, across the locational signals where we see, um, and uh, we can select uh, the type A projects. So this is the spread of the type A, um, really uh, locked into the the south, and then on the on the solar corridors. And these are actually in the areas which are have congestion. Um, the type B uh, shifting slightly up, but still found projects uh, located in the south, and then type C projects, um, actually a lot of them coming back into this area, anticipating the unlocking of the grid, and still large amounts in, in this particular area. You can also then have a look at it in terms of each of the different technologies. So in terms of PV, we can see dominantly in the upper half of the country. Um, and then if you have a look at the type, uh, type B on top of that, um, there's still developments of PV in the south, even though there's constrained areas, but a lot of it in, in the northern parts, moving all the way up into um, Limpopo, as well as uh, moving further down south into uh, KZN and Mpumalanga areas. So even though the resources aren't that good, we can see developments coming in this area. And then Type C, you can see it's, some of it's coming back into these areas, but still a lot into this northern part of the country. Um, with a wind, the Type A, we can see it's dominated in the south um, and a, a few in, in the northern parts. When we look at the developments, the near-term developments are still within these areas with uh, one development yeah, in the about 800 megawatts in, in KZN. And then for the future projects, we can see a greater spread across these areas for wind. Uh, for BESS, um, this is uh, the wind as well as the, sorry, the PV with the batteries. Um, uh, in the, I'd say the constrained areas dominantly, um, but as time moves on, you can see the batteries are still spread in anticipation for their further use in the grid with the combination of PV with the large volumes, there would need to be some form of displacement 
and we can see it's, the batteries are spread pretty well all over the place. Um, there's batteries with wind as well. Um, so the, these are the total batteries with wind. Um, so these are dominantly, I'd say, in the constrained areas of the batteries of the wind are located for the near-term projects, as well as the Type B projects. Um, but it's quite interesting that the Type C projects with the batteries are also anticipated in the greater northern parts of the country. It's quite interesting. Um, let's put this back to its, to its area. Okay, so then the next question we asked was, what would you like to participate in? Uh, which type of uh, programs? And the different colors. Uh, sorry, there's an echo if somebody wouldn't mind muting. Thank you. Please continue, Ronald. Ronald, I think you're on mute. Canuck, want to unmute. All right, is that, can, am I audible? Yes, sir, please continue. Okay, thank you so much. Um, all right, so the, the, these are DMRE projects, so a large portion of it is still interested in the DMRE projects. This is a combination of either DMRE or, project, or, or private projects, um, uh, YAS additional DMRE or Munich projects, but a large volume um, distributed over the entire country still interested in, in DMRE projects. In private sector, um, YAS pure private sector, um, also a very good spread across the, the entire country. And yeah, you can see the mix of plant uh, for the pure private off taker which is quite interesting. A large portion of it is actually wind um, and uh, PV with batteries and PV on its own, and then PV and batteries itself. And this provides you the distribution across the various um, provinces as well. If we if we then have a look at all the private indications of pro projects, there's a significant amount of private uh, uptake. And if we sum them all up, we can see that um, quite interesting, PV and BEST becomes an attractive option with wind and uh, slightly higher than PV um, and then BEST on its own as, as an interested area. Munich on their own is, is a relatively small portion um, and located in a, in a particular area. Um, these are all the municipal ones. So if we had to have a look at the Munichs, um, they tend to be um, located in particular areas, dominated by PV and battery, which is quite interesting. Um, but you can have a look at any of these combinations. Uh, we then had a look at how does this cluster around the actual substations. So these are the supply areas at the top, um, the colors are the different um, energy sources, and the volumes are shown in terms of uh, megawatts at the top of each of the supply areas. And the lower area shows the supply areas again, and these tells you the volume of applicants in the particular area. So you can see a relatively low uh, amount of applicants in, in the KZN, where the Northern Cape still dominates uh, with 106 applicants. And we can categorize these, of course, um, by the, the types. So type A, the near-term projects, large amount still in the Northern Cape, um, hydro areas, with a, a, fa a fairly equal spread um, of, of technology. And you can see a large mix of, um, uh, of uh, applicants in these areas. Um, so in Pumalanga, there's fairly low in, in KZN, even Gauteng, um, but the remaining are, are double digit figures uh, across the, 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 the various areas. Type B, um, 30, almost 32 gigawatts. Um, uh, Northern Cape is still high with the Eastern Cape dominating, but we can see pickups in Mpumalanga and Limpopo um, uh, as, as those times uh, move through. And then Type C, we can see a shift um, still coming back into the Northern Cape, but into the Free State and Mpumalanga uh, dominating for the longer term uh, perspective of development. 
Um, these are the EIAs. We won't go in these in detail, but you can have a look at the buildup of EIAs um, for the different projects to see how they spread across um, the different periods um, and which are future current uh, applications. Um, but they generally uh, follow the type A and B uh, very well. Um, in terms of the, the megawatts, um, this is the distribution of, of the different categories of plant. So you dominated by solar, um, 55 gigawatts or 40, almost 42 percent, um, wind, 22 uh, percent. Um, and um, we can see the spread amongst uh, these areas. So the Northern Cape dominates Free State, Hydra. Uh, and if we look at PV itself, um, we can see dominant in this northern belt and um, um, and in the, the solar areas of the Northern Cape, um, uh, the high volumes, even though there's less amount of uh, applicants, most of the high volumes are in the Northern Cape. A large amount in Limpopo in the Free State and the Northwest, almost 10 gigawatts in each of those different areas, and a significant increase in Gauteng, almost um, 4.8 gigawatts. Um, similar to the Hydra area, and even an increase in um, Pumalanga. Um, so uh, the, these, of course, can uh, you, you can have a look at it in the different uh, categories of types. If we look at wind, uh, we can see the spread over time. Uh, Northern Cape, uh, this cluster at the top, almost 8 gigawatts. Hydra Central, uh, 7 gigawatts. The Eastern Cape, 4.2 gigawatts. Pumalanga 2.8, the Western Cape uh, 2.7 gigawatts, and about 1.4 in the KZN uh, area. Uh, these are the combination of the batteries um, uh, between wind, about 13% for PV and 11% for wind with batteries um, within these particular areas. Um, we then asked about ancillary services if there were interest in ancillary services. And I think the the idea here yeah, was to have a look at, as time moves on, if additional ancillary services are required, what would be the appetite from the market to provide these ancillary services, and which categories would favor which, um, which technologies. Um, so we can see a large volume uh, indicated a um, appetite to participate in ancillary services, almost 117 um, uh, gigawatts. Um, and <clears throat> these the green shows you the interested amount within each of the different categories. Um, and the lower area shows the uh, types of com the combination of um, ancillary services that uh, people are interested in. So a large amount of the interest is in voltage control. Um, you'll see they spread amongst all of these different categories. So, so these are all voltage control area uh, um, and delivery services of interest, almost spread amongst every every one of the different interest areas. Almost um, 100 gigawatts of interest, a large amount of interest from PV and wind, and even the combination of batteries. Um, we've got uh, constrained generation. So these were interest in uh, constrained generation. So almost 47 gigawatts, uh, there's one at the bottom here as well, uh, of constrained generation. And um, even uh, PV, wind, and even the combination of batteries indicating a willingness to um, participate in, in these categories. Um, uh, we, yeah, so let's just break that down. Um, so you can break it down into PV itself and what are the particular areas of interest or any any particular um, category of technology to see which of the areas, uh, which which of the areas and you can see um, batteries with wind uh, reserves become a, a an interesting uh, combination that they they look in uh, looking for. Uh, so we broke the categories down into then what are the categories and where do we dominate? And you can see the reactive power is uh, the largest portion, reserves the second largest. There are some uh, interested parties in black start capability and, um, and uh, 
um, constrained generation about seventeen uh, percent. Um, and of course, you can have a look and break it down into the participations that that you're interested in. Batteries um, uh, were a fairly large amount, forty six point eight gigawatts of of batteries um, with um, uh, seventy four um, gigawatt hours. And so this is almost double this amount. So the batteries, um, are significantly normally the previous study was about a four hour batteries. These look like uh, two hour batteries, um, but large capacity relative to the same volumes that we saw uh, last time. Dominated by the participation with PV and batteries together and uh, um, dominated in the free state. So the free state hydro central, this uh, area here is the dominant area followed by the uh, Northern Cape and Western Cape. And these make sense as these are uh, the high PV areas with high constrained conditions. And um, they make sense to have a good combination of, of the batteries. And I think uh, further understanding how these batteries are, or, or, you know, or how these storage systems are going to be used is important and what storage systems are going to be used. And, and therefore, um, uh, having more detailed uh, surveys on these would be of great interest to understand how, how the intentions to utilize them and what are the actual storage devices, technologies that are, are being looked at. In terms of type A, um, dominated in the Northern Cape, um, the Northwest and the Hydro area, um, <clears throat> making a lot of sense that these are the congested areas. Um, type B, um, in the Free State, um, Eastern Cape, and then going up to the northern parts of the country. And then type C, uh, which is the longer term batteries, still concentrated in the free state in Hydra, so the, ma the main corridor, um, and then also moving back to the Western Cape, um, Pumalanga, Northwest, and really spread across um, uh, the country, which is really useful. The next question we asked is, where would you like to be connected on? So the blue colors, show you the ESCOM network and the other colors show the um, uh, the, um, the uh, networks outside of the ESCOM, ESCOM network itself. So on the ESCOM network, the um, 132 kV or the distribution level is the lighter blue, this area here. So vast majority are, are want to connect onto the 132 kV network, but there's significant interest connecting to greater than 132 kV network. Um, but the, the vast majority really want to connect directly onto the ESCOM network, um, dominated, as you can see, by the, the blue colors. There are um, a, 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 about a, a gigawatt um, that want to connect within the Munich, um, and then um, a smaller amount um, that's... Uh, uh, um, that has not yet decided exactly which uh, part of the network they want to actually connect to. But you can see the pressure on the um, ESCOM network um, to be able to connect and deliver uh, these plants. So in order to understand where those congestion points are, um, these relate to the GCCA supply areas, and um, uh, you can then connect onto these and have a look at the volumes uh, that are connected at any particular substation. And you can have a look at the, um, the mix of plant that is actually connected at any particular area. So in the, in, the, in the Northern Cape, we dominated by PV, but we also got lots of wind and then a combination of large amount of batteries. Uh, in the Free State, uh, really dominated by PV again. Um, with uh, batteries coming in with a smaller amount of wind. Uh, hydra center, uh, wind really dominates and a combination of, of, of batteries. Northwest, we see lots of PV and a combination of, of wind with a small amount of, of um, wind uh, starting to creep into that area. Pumalanga, uh, wind and PV, very much the same. Um, PVM batteries very much the same, uh, um, and um, this is a combination of PV wind and batteries, um, and then a mix between between the two. 
Limpopo dominated by PV and, and having some battery combinations. Eastern Cape dominated by wind with a small amount of PV introduced. Gauteng uh, dominated by PV, but there is some interest in wind in, in these particular areas. And you can see a large amount around particular substations uh, in, in, the, in the Gauteng area. Uh, Western Cape as well dominated around Jurafia, Kappa, uh, Galinia, and uh, dominated by wind with some PV and, and batteries connected to it. And then KZN, uh, there's wind um, uh, within these areas with very limited amount of uh, PV uh, connected to, to, the, to the particular areas. Um, let's have a look here. This is a, <laughs> excuse me, a view, a very similar view to the one in the past, but it really ranks um, the amount of um, substations and the volumes at each of the substations. And this shows you the volumes of interest of applications or in the survey at those particular substations. So um, this is the, uh, the Northern Cape. You can see the volumes are uh, ranked. Um, and generally our substations can handle about um, just over around about 1,500 megawatts. So you can see lots of pressure beyond this then for additional substations in the area. And these show the interest, the count of, of people. Uh, so although there's 400, there's only one uh, applicant in this area. Um, where yeah, we can see around McCordy, although there's 2,800, there's a significant volumes around it. So, so this you can go through and also have a look at the different periods of what um, where the interest is around at particular substations, what are the volumes, and what is the category of plant um, that is that is available at that particular site. Um, all right, so let's go have. I think that's the that's the end of this uh, presentation. So, so really, a uh, thank you to all the survey contributors for their time and valuable insights that they provide us. It's really appreciated and. Um, and we hope that it's also valuable to you as 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 you can extract value out of it. I think just to show you where you can access this, so um, it it will be on the association's website. So that is a go to place to get it from. But it's also on the um, NTCSA site. So if you go to NTCSA and you go to uh, business and operations and you go to business, you see at the bottom here yeah, it says. Um, uh, a renewable survey of South Africa, and these are the past surveys, and the interactive map will will come up. So this map, um, if you select uh, any of these, it is interactive, and you'll be able to do exactly what I was doing on the screen. Um, you can toggle yeah through the different pages, or if you want to go to a particular site, you can click on the center, and and for example, if you go to the renewable megawatts. Um, this will bring up the map, and and if you click, um, say you wanted a combination of PV and wind, then you must just press Control and select the second site, and you will be able to get that information. And then you can click on the additional um, filters to filter out uh, where the plant is and see what the um, combinations of interest that you're looking at are. So this is uh, is available on 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 the website um, uh, um, uh, for for your convenience. So to that that would be the end of the presentation. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ronald. Uh, it was ex exceptionally interesting. I think we all got got, got a lot of questions to ask. Uh, but again, a, a brilliant job to you and uh, uh, your, your team for the data analysis, and thank you for publishing it so quickly. Um, I think it's one of the biggest questions, but just to reiterate, it's been posted in the chat. The dashboard is available. You're welcome to uh, <laughs> cl click it and access there. I just want to ask if anybody can mute. We'll, uh, we're going to open up the to the floor for Q and A's, and. Uh, after we'll do a short closing. I'm going to direct everybody to the Q&A uh, portal within Teams and uh, we'll take the questions from there. But you need not ask it there. We might um, ask you to unmute and ask your questions as well. There are a few questions posted already. I'll start at the bottom. Uh, Jason's asked, can we access, access this tool? And if so, how? 
Um, I think Ronald's just answered that at the end. There's a link that will be uh, that's uh, available. Santosh has actually already posted it, and Vet, you can access it in the chat section already. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Raphael. Uh, Ronald, I think this one's for you around the cluster sub page. What's the difference between the two graphs? I'm not sure if you can uh, quickly uh, get the one up again, Ronald. Ronald, you're on mute as well, if you just want to answer the question. Sure. So, so I, I imagine it's, yeah, so, so they're very similar information sets. Um, so this one, yeah, provides you um, very much the same information. It just gives you a, a ranking then of, of the substations over time. They're really very similar information on this one and on this one. Um, it just gives you a slightly different uh, perspective uh, of, of the volumes that are there. Uh, they, they're really much the same, um, to be honest. Um, but <clears throat> sometimes uh, one view it provides some more insights than the other. Uh, Thanks, Ronald. Rafael, I hope we answered your question. The next question, I'm going to go through the, the list that's been asked, and then I'll take the hands off that. But you are welcome to raise your hands if you need, want to ask a question directly. But I, we, we encourage you to use the Q&A chat chat box. The next question is from Nazia. Has the survey included accounted for anticipated implications from the generation connection capacity assessment, the GCC 2025 curtailment addendum that was published in January 2024? Um, I think there's the link, but Ronald, do you want to quickly answer that? Yeah, they, I think um, they are. They, the survey doesn't provide access. It really just provides us insights on where the market would like to get access, and it gives us insights on how to place them in our TDP assumptions, and also to to have a look at just the same way the um, curtailment uh, came about. We can then have a look at how we can optimize the networks around particular areas uh, with the insights that we get for this. So they're not uh, directly uh, coupled to each other. That the the survey, you know, re relates directly to the. Um, uh, um, uh, curtailment itself, I'd say it 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 more more an informative document survey to inform the future of how we need to deal with these volumes coming on the grid. Yeah, for for those of you who may not be so familiar with the survey, essentially this is forward looking. So this is what um, to inform ESCOM what the industry wants to connect, how much and when. Well, the GCC will tell you the current status of uh, capacities available on lines and substations. So they're separate but informed by each other. Thank you, Nazi. I hope your question was answered. The next one was from Ryan Jarrett. How is Grid Access Unit taking applications for private batteries through interaction with Grid Access Unit? There is unsure for projects outside uh, battery energy storage program. Stand low battery charging from Grid in off peak and dispatching at peak are net consumers. Why are, be, where, where are they being looked at as taking grid capacity? Um, and then I think the next yeah. one is to do with uh, OCGT. Ronald, do you have a response to that? Okay, yeah, so um, batteries, depend on how they operate, um, will will either congest the grid or, 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 or decongest the grid. So it's, it be becomes important to understand how that battery is going to be operated um, to determine whether there's grid capacity or, or, or not. Um, so the, this, the way that, that that plant will be cycled becomes important. Um, and, and I think that's part of the and part of the reasons why we need to understand more details on how these storage devices are going to be utilized. Um, to, uh, to be able to determine um, if there is grid capacity or not, the ones that are are currently um, in the in the DMRE programs are at the disposal of the system operator to dispatch. So they get paid for capacity, and the system operator uses them to optimize the the grid and optimize the network. Where that might not be the case in the in, in for a private battery. 
and therefore it has to be assessed to see how exactly you want to operate it um, to make sure that the grid can handle those conditions that you, you would like it to dispatch and charge in. Thank you, Ronald. That was a, great, a really good answer. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question in the queue. Uh, this one is from our colleague at, at Nell. Uh, we are going to limit the questions today to the survey. So if you asking questions that were perhaps better suited to uh, grid access or something, we, 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 may, we might take them today. Uh, but Ronald, there's questions from AJ, uh, from, EG, from EGP. In the interest of connecting to existing grid, there are plans within ESCOM to make available, is there plans within ESCOMs to make available open source grid integration models for eventual national electricity market in the future? Uh, so that IPPs can mitigate risks and that originate from the grid, i.e. SSR issues from serious compensation capacitors, for example, or number two for EMT studies pertaining to EMT model validation as per grid code requirements in mm -hmm. order to perform model validation the fault record at the PUC needs to be recreated at the model to compare the plant response to the, to the model response. Is this a question related to the survey, Ronald, or would you like to defer to uh, another time when? Yeah. It's not related to the survey, but I can provide a comment to it. Um, and so, so grid models are really important, um, and so is privacy of models really important. And, and um, we and we respect both needs so so it's really important and secondly it's also important that a common platform is used um, uh, to be able to do these studies so uh, it's unlikely that it's going to be possible to to share a, a, a complete file with people to just do these these studies there has to be non-disclosure and ideally, we'd like to start developing uh, models like they have for that they have in Australia, where you can couple onto a, say, for instance, a EMT model um, that has the detailed models behind a firewall, but you can do multiple studies across that platform. And that would be able to give you insights on how to better tune your devices and with the interaction of the um, of the other devices on the grid, but still respecting the privacy of the of the models themselves, and we would look to develop that um, uh, type of a platform to uh, allow you to do those studies. Thank you, Ronald. I think the next we move on to the next question now, which is from Kumar Saroj Kumar. Is there a way to correlate the capacity depletion in one area with respects to project development in others? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat that again? Yeah, maybe there's some context, but I think I'll, I'll repeat it again. Is there a way to correlate the capacity depletion one area with respect to project development in another area? If the question is not clear, we can come on, yeah. to unmute and... Uh, no, sure, yeah. Okay. I, I, what I understand of the question is that, uh, and we do see that, uh, um, you know, when we saw it in the last survey and a little bit of this survey as well, is um, is as you get congestion in one area, you see developers then focusing their attention in other areas where there's still capacity. And I think we can see it in this survey, but... You can't see it as clearly as the previous survey because the volumes are just so high. It's more than double the entire survey of, of last time and there's a large spread. But what we can see, for example, in Gauteng, it's gone up by more than 10 times. So Gauteng has got one of the highest um, capacities that is available and we can see the developers moving into Gauteng by, by more than 10 times the previous surveys that we've had. So there's definitely, a, a, um, I think, the, the good thing about these surveys and, and sharing this information amongst each other is that everybody gets better insights on how to create this, uh, where better places are to go and how to create this capacity over time. So yes, I think they, definitely we see movement in into areas where there is grid capacity and, and people moving out initially from the areas where there's constraints. But the long-term plans, and this is why I think it's so important, the long-term plans still indicate that, yes, we're moving out now, but please, we want you to unlock these areas as well. And that's why the long-term indications of where the uh, um, developers want to go are important so that we don't keep 
those places constrained and that we unlock them for those future developments. So I think it's a bit of both, you know, where you're moving out right now, but also where you want your developments to actually take place for for the future. Thank you, Ronald. I think this actually relates to the next question from Bernard. Okay. Uh, if if current interest is being driven by grid limitations, and it seems to be so given the results of the survey, is it then proper to use the survey results to guide grid investments? And it was um, uh, further asked by Alistair, will future TDPs factor this in? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the TDPs um, use this data as well as, and and that's why we encourage the participation. You know, uh, we <clears throat> to refine where you want to connect is not adequate just to have where's the wind and the solar, uh, because there's so much wind and solar, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where the best places are for developers. And so these surveys are critical to show us where those are. And this in combination with the applications of budget quotes, the cost estimate letters, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the bid window submissions, uh, the EIAs and so forth all go into a mix when we set up the TDP um, uh, um, files to see where the unlocking needs to be. So, so it, uh, it's yeah, it it all fits into you know where do we need to develop the network to unlock, um, and then that gets uh, moderated against how fast can we build out the grid so that we can <clears throat> so we can't place stuff in grid where there isn't grid. Um, but we can have a look at the interest and how to uh, try and accelerate that. And this is how curtailment and so forth all comes about to try and find mechanisms to connect it as fast as possible onto the grid. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, I think. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. sorry, Go one last thing. I, I think this data where it's also be used is that you must remember if you look at the volumes that are coming here, there's also going to be pressure not just on the transmission grid, but on the collector networks that need to collect the renewable plant and bring them onto the transmission grid. And uh, um, and also to optimize that um, so that you don't get, uh, you know, it might look that um, this 30 kilometer line is much more efficient than building a 40 kilometer line that has a higher capacity. But if you look at the collective uh, interest in that area, uh, you really have to have the optimal solution for the collective and not for the individual. So this data also provides great uh, insights and it's work that we will be doing as well um, to have a look at how to develop those collector networks to provide a speed of access and uh, least cost connection at those particular point. And the value of that is it should speed up um, applications and so forth because it clearly indicates how to create access onto the grid at the distribution level, as well as where the most appropriate um, transmission future substations and so forth need to be connected in, in the grid. So it is it's not just used for the TDP, which is the transmission, but it's also used, as you can see from the survey, large interest to connect into the distribution network um, to optimize those connection points as well. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, just to further add, look, uh some of the categorizations of the projects type C are longer term. So if yes. you've done any prospecting on as a developer, you should contribute them to the survey and it'll inform Ronald and his yes. team that there's an interest in the area. It, it need not be what you are just what you're looking at the GCC and saying, now let's go build around there. Add your entire pipeline to it. And that's developers who have done so have now signaled to ESCOM that there's that there's um demand for grid in, in specific areas and the, they should developing the infrastructure there. But thank you so much, Ronald and Bono, for the question. I'll move on to the next one. Raphael has asked, is the project database used for the survey publicly available? Yes, you can download it from the from the Power BI site. Yeah, I'll add to that one there. The data available and presented today is available for download. The source data is not, as per yes. the survey protocol. That's only anonymized, and the only people who have access to it is the Ronald Caswell and Sanjin, who are the within NTC specifically. So no uh, commercially sensitive information is made available to the associations to anybody, but ESCOM would have that information anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ronald, I move on to the next one. Uh, 
from Harrow, would you be able to say whether many projects that were type B in the 2023 survey have become type A now? Yes, we can do that correlation. So we can, but uh, yeah. So what we just so just for interest, um, what the way we check it is that we took the 23 survey, and then we check that against the applications that we physically receive uh, to correlate the value of the survey. Um, and and the correlation is extremely high. So, for example, if we got a, a indication in the survey where there's 800 megawatts coming in a particular area, we would then offset that with what applications did we actually receive in that area, and typically that would be the near-term projects. And what what came about is that you would see there would be four applications for 200 megawatts around about that dot where they showed the 800 comes. Um, and when we tested that against many of the different variations, um, it correlated extremely well to the to the applications that we've seen. So, so and, and hence why we're continuing with the survey is because we actually see great value of giving us insights of what is likely to come uh, it, through the application process. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, the next question is from Devin Chown. In the case of Artemis substation, is this substation, if this substation has not yet been built, unless it is now under construction, how does this relate to the figures of capacity available and allocated per year? Um, when you say allocated per year, yeah. So this doesn't allocate it per year. What it just does is it, so so may, may the question is, how do you how do you allocate the renewables to the substation? And, and this doesn't allocate capacity, it just allocates interest based on the XY coordinates that have been provided relative to the closest transmission sub. So what it would be what it would be saying is we're not allocating capacity, we we identify an interest around that substation. And this would give us the volumes of interest around that substation. And, and uh, it might not have current capacity, but what it gives us is insights of maybe we actually need two subs there, or maybe we need three. And where is the best place to place it in that area? So it's not really an allocation of capacity. It's more an, a, a, an expression of interest around these substations to give us insights of the volumes that are are likely to come in, possibly the pressures on those substations for additional substations in those areas. Thank you, Ronald. I hope, Jamin, I hope that answered your question. Uh, the next question is from Francis. Thanks again for the survey. What certainly is, what certainty is associated with the survey submissions, i.e. to prevent imaginary projects from being entered? Is there, is there triangulations with EIA applications or any submissions to verify veracity yes. of the numbers. Uh, I can also answer this, but you go ahead first. Yeah, no, 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 you were. But I think the first part is we actually ask the um, submission for the EIA numbers if they tell us they are in category A, for example. OK, and <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, so, but may, maybe you can also answer um, say it. It's a, a part of the survey is you must submit the contact uh, details. Otherwise, we won't accept uh, your, your entry. And uh, under the protocol, the survey ESCOM can co uh, contact you to verify. Um, and I believe the ESCOM, we won't obviously give the numbers where there was potentially a sample done to, um, you know, audit the sum of the results. So I'll go on to the next question. Santosh, question from Ibanda in the chat. Based on this survey, which grid corridors is NTCSA prioritizing for new capacity investment? I think that's the first part. Part and how much capacity and by when? And what renewable capacity, in your view, can the economy realistically absorb in the 134 gigawatts of expressed interest by industry? <laughs> okay, that's a shotgun question. A yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I think, uh, I mean, if you if you just look at the volumes, you can see that. Um, there's lots of pressure for the, you know, just the Northern Cape itself is 30 gigawatts in this area. You, you know, the free state is 20 gigawatts, um, you know, so so um, the Eastern Cape is 10 gigawatts. So, so, so there is a large, you know, these North-South corridors are critical. Um, and and as the power, so so all of those three corridors that we proposed, you know, this the first corridor is to augment this existing corridor. 
So, and then we need to develop two new corridors, a northern corridor that facilitates these and a southern corridor that facilitates these. Okay, because the load centers, the you know, the single largest load center is actually this in, in the KZN area and then followed yeah, by Gauteng's four, four load centers. So we have to move the power up along these corridors and these corridors facilitate all the connections along the line. So you, you we build the line, but you can loop in the lines along the, the, the period. So, so these become critical corridors to, to, build, to build in. You know, and and then you can see that there's a lot of interest along these corridors as well. So these start to be to be local pressurized, but the critical corridors are these uh, north south uh, or south to north corridors that need to be connected. Um, sorry, what was the other? I know there were another two parts of the question. The one was the, the problem, corridors. Uh, I'll go back to the corridor. How much capacity? And oh right, when? yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So so. I think um, I think um, they, they, when you look at the volumes here, this is 133 gigawatts of renewable plant. Okay, now um, the largest uh, by 2040. Uh, the generally the system studies, and this is like I say. Meridian studies, the PCC studies, uh, you know, the IRP is slightly lower, but generally they're asking for around about 80 gigawatts of renewables by 2040. You know, so so so, and the the interest currently, you've heard that the president has said there's 22 gigawatts in the pipeline. There's six gigawatts already on the system. That's 28. Uh, there's PV of six gigawatts already. That's 32. So, so I would say that this is a large percentile above uh, the the demand in any study. I would say. Um, so, from the grid perspective, it's really great. It gives us a great perspective of where they would come. But I, I think the volumes exceed any. In you know the amount of load that's physically in the system is about twenty eight to thirty gigawatts during the daytime. You know, to, you, so you can you can test uh, you know the, the fraction. So it will be very difficult to even bring. I would say the sixty gigawatts that's anticipated in the near term, because this sixty gigawatts would bring us up to almost twenty forty already. Um, and the load hasn't grown to 2040 already. So, so I think in the near term, uh, the market showing, uh, you know, a lot of interest, um, but is the, the volume of load to actually absorb all of this interest uh, might be staggered over a longer uh, time frame, I would say. Thank you, Ronald. I'm going to move on to the next question just to give more people a chance. It's from Ramachandran. Uh, I'm not sure this was addressed in the survey, but I defer to you, Ronald. How much plant, how much plant load factor of PV wind in e in per year? What is the rate of per per unit, and how much load consumable in every year? Um. Yeah. So so we're not judging. Uh, we're not doing an energy balance study in this. So the purpose of this this um, survey um, is purely to ask developers what is your interest, what in which type of plant do you believe that uh, you want to drive, where would you like to drive it, um, so that we can prioritize and develop the network in line with what the market wants to to develop. I think the other studies like the IRP, like the other studies that are coming out would are, are their their purpose is more to define that energy balance over time. Um, but these this survey provides even those studies with a really good data set of the selection of optimization for those type of studies, I, I would say. So I don't think that question is 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 the is is the purpose of this survey is not to answer that that particular question, but this survey would feed into those type of studies. I would I, I would say. 
Thank you, Ronald. Next question is from Ethan van Dimmen. Among the survey's findings, which insights do you consider the most actionable for ESCOM strategic planning? What were the most critical insights that emerged from the data? That's a very good question. Yeah, well, I think the one is that um, the network development to host all of this capacity is not available in the distribution networks. And the collector networks are just as important as the corridor networks. So, so um, the, the, I think the, the first bit that we have to pay attention to is that you have to get, you have to efficiently get the renewable plant energy onto the transmission grid. And, uh, and, that, uh, and, and that is one of the insights it gives us, is, is where around the collector areas should you be hosting and developing collector networks and additional transmission substations so that we can clearly indicate where those nodes are. Then those become um, very good building blocks on how then to connect them into the major corridors to collect them onto the grid. But without the collector networks, it, it creates uh, congestion at a lower level as well. And I think the insights from this one positions us very well to actually start developing those collector networks and streamlining the applications uh, um, uh, actually to connect onto the onto the grids. I think the second one is that I think the corridors that we have identified are still um, the evidence from this data still shows us that those corridors are the right corridors and that we should proceed with pace uh, because um, there's a lot of appetite the corridors are in the right areas uh, and and that rollout is is really important uh, uh, to, to build very interesting oh, i'm sure we, we we like to think <laughs> now what escom thinks from the results it's very insightful um Next question is from Chris Pillingham. What is the maximum renewable energy integration that will be acceptable to the system operator to pr to preserve stability, etc.? Question is based on the 120 gigs of renewable interest versus the current MD maximum demand. Yeah. So so generally the um, uh, so so when yeah so when you talk of grid stability, um, uh, we need to talk about instantaneous penetration. So in a particular hour, how much can you connect onto the grid? And, and generally up to about 50% you can handle with, 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 uh, with the grid. I'd say 30 to 50% beyond that, you need to start augmenting the grid. The grid becomes too weak to support the renewable plant. So we need to add synchronous condensers and supporting mechanisms to stiffen up the grid that you could push up to about 75% instantaneous values. Beyond that, you need to be careful because there's not enough synchronous machines that are contributing to the stability of the system. And you probably need to start introducing um, grid forming technology, which is not quite there yet. Um, and <clears throat> so once you get to beyond 75%, um, uh, uh, you you need to you need to be uh, careful of of how you are integrating beyond that point. Um, I, you know, I, a lot of the countries go beyond these points, and in certain parts of the network, like for instance the Northern Cape, we well beyond a hundred percent as at a local level. But on an islanded grid like South Africa, where you don't have export capacity or large neighbors with large a load, um, it becomes a lot more challenging beyond those particular areas. And one of the one of the areas that provides grid forming technology is um, battery storage, um, because they have a natural energy storage facility um, that can absorb or 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 or, um, or provide active uh, and reactive power. And and so you you would need to look at combining those different elements to provide stability beyond those the, the you know those percentages. I would say, but yeah. But up to, I'd say, 70 odd with augmented uh, synchronous condensers, you, you, you probably could get to that level. But beyond those levels, we need to start looking at uh, other technology supports. Uh, okay. 
Uh, thank you, Ronald. Uh, next questions from AJ uh, Trickham. Thank you very much for the informative presentation. Would it be possible to extend the survey to show where connections can be unlocked at ESCOM distribution substation level? Uh, apologies if the survey already accommodates for this. Uh, Ronald, would you want to take this one first and I can also contribute after? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we mainly focused here at the transmission side, um, but I think part of that collector network study that we want to engage with the distribution and uh, um, other distribution service providers is intended to, to have a look at what that capacity is and, and also how it should be developed. So we'd like to use this study to actually understand what is that capability and what are the constraints um, in the distribution networks to actually provide some insights in that. Yeah. Okay, and from the association side, this has been a request uh, in the past. If we can conduct the same survey at the distribution level, uh, we're considering it. It is a lot more complicated. Uh, this is just a lot more uh, different parts of ESCOM to deal with um, more substations, but it is something we'll, we will consider in future. We we would likely not merge it with the transmission survey, the one you're seeing right now, but may run it as a separate process next year. But it is a point taken, AJ, that there may be a need for it. The next question comes from uh, Ryan again. Would you, would the, could the survey look to include 132 kV ESCOM distribution substations? The view of the grid survey is looking at a transmission level. A view at a more granular level might not, might be of value to ESCOM and the developers looking to fill gaps which do not need transmission approval for good access. So, so can you just uh, go over that again? So, yeah, it's, it's a mouthful. I'll go slower. <laughs> Could the survey look to include 132 kV ESCOM distribution substations? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I think I think part of the uh, part of the observations that we got from the data is that the survey gives a XY coordinate, but when we see the applications, that XY coordinate is, I would say, representative of where it would come, but not specific. But once you get the application, it's much more precise of where it would be, and it might it 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 it. it I think the accuracy of this might need to be improved in terms of the XY and to a lot of, you know, the future projects. I think they are also just um, indications of where they're, where they're going to be. So they're not that precise either. And when you go down to the distribution level, uh, you really want a lot higher precision to know exactly where to connect the substation and so forth. So, so normally when you would do the collector networks and so forth, that's where we would like to actually pull out the EIAs, look at what space you've actually uh, demarcated your EIA on, uh, um, and and then look a bit more detail on how to com combine it. So I think your comments earlier are very true, is that when you go one level down, it does become a little more complex to 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 assess, and you need a little more accuracy in in that assessment. Yeah. Thank you, Ronald. It is something we will discuss next year as the industry associations. Uh, the next question is from Otung. I think I can answer this one. Th thank you. Thanks for wind. Was the differentiation between concrete and steel tower? Unfortunately, it wasn't. It wasn't part of the survey. We didn't didn't ask. Um, but you're welcome to take this up with the SUIA, one of the SUIA working groups, maybe the assets or the operations one. They may be able to, to assist you for that kind of information. The next question is the transfer from Santosh. Thank you. Question from Justin in the chat. What opportunities are there for waste to energy technologies in the renewable energy industry? Sure. Uh, Arnold, do we have an, an answer for that? Um. You're welcome to participate in the survey. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we indeed, if this, we may add it next year. So that if there is interest, we can gauge it. But it's a, it's a point taken by the survey owners. We shall add it next year. Thank you so much. Um, question from Jane Kotsa in the chat. How do we maximize local content in these projects? Yeah, I, I don't think that's a survey question. I mean, I, yeah. I think that might be people who look at the survey and look at the localization and look at the particular regions they're in, and they possibly could use that uh, to benefit that, that type of analysis. <clears throat> but uh, I, uh, it's not, um, I would say, direct uh, directed at this uh, outcome of the survey itself. 
uh, I agree, but it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I hope the, the geography spread of the projects will, will help for localization content. Uh, the next question comes from Grant Smith. A wonderful survey, great job. I'd like to correlate wheeling demand so far as it is possible to tell with interest to connect generation to the grid. Any insight into how that would be would be appreciated, how to do that would be appreciated. So, sorry, I don't know. I didn't get the first part. Uh, just I'd, I'd love to correlate wheeling demand oh, right, uh, with yeah. interest to connection generation to the grid. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, the uh, the wheeling would be almost classified under the private sector, um, private sector um, interest. So, so under this one, yeah, all the private sector interests are likely to, you know, be some form of wheeling. And, and that should be, uh, you know, uh, um, you should be able to get some indication from that. Thanks, Ronald. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, we couldn't account to cater for everything, but there is potentially some insights if uh, if you study the data to maybe do some correlation work on that. Side. Yeah. Yeah. And if they, if, if they, uh, you're more than welcome to suggest questions for the next survey that you feel might provide some insights that you, that you would like. So, so as well to anybody, if you have questions that you think would enhance the survey, you're more than welcome to um, send them through. And and we can have a look at them. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, the next question is from Kruger Ravenstein. Can you please elaborate what is understood under constrained generation that will be provided by renewables and batteries? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the constrained generation is effectively curtailment. Um, so it's um, so generally it's generation that could be dispatched in a market that then is being constrained off the grid because of um, some form of congestion on the grid. Um, so, so it's a, a, a mechanism to uh, have a look at, um, you know, constraining of gener generation um, and, and to participate in that. I think a submission was made to NERSA to have a look if that could be a category under ancillary services. Um, as a constrained generation uh, condition. So it's really good talent. Yeah, thank you. Next question is from Alberto Prince. Please can we share the recording of the session? Uh, yes, absolutely. It will be available afterwards. If you're having trouble accessing it, please contact uh, one of the associations, Vet Talyard or Santosh Sukram. We'll be happy to facilitate get it to you. The next question is from Tumi Singh. How is the transmission company thinking about demand response at the moment? Flexibility through a VPP can significantly increase capacity at a low cost. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's not quite a survey question, but uh, I mean, it's more an ancillary service or a capacity one. And um, I think the the the, the problems uh, and there's no problem. I think if there is ability to add that type of flexibility, that's great. But very often the congestion that we're talking about is in, um, for example, with the wind, you could get three, three and a half gigawatts that need to be constrained off the grid for multiple hours, even a, a day or two. Um, so you have very, very short periods with very, very high volumes of um, uh, of uh, generation. And then it drops down to, you know, much, much lower, about 60% of the of, of the wind's value that you see. And the, the problem with this is that a very few load can, I mean, 3000 megawatts is bigger than 80% uh, of the province's load, you know, the, any province's load. So, so having load that could suddenly absorb that volume um, is is unlikely. So you probably will be able to alleviate some of some of the the volumes, but unlikely to alleviate all the volumes. But uh, I mean, if they if they if we can alleviate any of the congestion, um, we're more than happy to look at it, ways to do it. Um, I mean, part of this is also tariff reform that should signal uh, signal the value of 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 time of of the load in coincidence with the value of the generation on on the system, and I think those reforms will 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 come in there, you know over time uh, to better signal 
um, these conditions and add value for those particular market conditions. Okay, thank you, Ronald. Uh, next question is from Bunani. Why does the platform not listing or indicating the names of the developers or stakeholders interested in the grid capacity in a certain area? Yeah. So, so I think generally the, the reason why is that we keep that anonymous. Um, the, the idea is that um, the value that we want to see is really what wants to come on the grid and that we want to share. And we, we want to keep those kind of interests um, private so that people can collaborate in a way that they feel that they the, their interests will not be compromised. And, and I think that the volumes that we see in the, the areas and the participation, um, people uh, appreciate that uh, anonymousness in the in the in in the in the surveys and for us there's no there's no real value knowing is it IPPA or IPPB um, we really interested in the survey to look at how to augment the grid and and that's more in, more important I think to us than to know exactly which IPP is coming in a particular area or not. Uh, I think that's well explained. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ronald. Next question is from AJ. Would you consider adding in an overlay of load nodes and the expected growth over time? Would it be possible to to include this uh, for this survey instead of the next one? So I'll just read uh, again. Would you consider adding? Yeah, an, no, an overlay I understand. Nodes? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Got you. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that is almost a separate survey if you think about it. Which, which is, um, you know, where do customers? And, and I think that's actually the, um, you know, my personal view is that's actually the most important one because uh, all this power that we see has to be sunk into some load, and that load needs to be there to be able to sink in, and the, the growth is important. So generally, in the in the in the uh, in the TDP, we do give a perspective of what those values would be, but and we would like to engage with the um, with with the uh, load to see what we can make pu public because uh, very often um, that information provides uh, um, in terms of their growth strategies, and so we would see have to have a look at how you know can we do the survey with the. Uh, with the connected customers and how could we create it in a way that would not compromise their positions as well. But uh, we can definitely have, have a look at looking at the load and then the generation and, and, and provide information around that. Okay, thank you very much. Next question is from uh, Clinton Carter-Brown. Great work, thank you for this. If the if the present 10-year TDP is fully implemented as planned, is there a view of which of these projects would be able to be connected, transmission capacity? And then yeah. if, mm. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, so the the trans, uh, up to about 2035 is where the TDP goes, is around about, um, I think, 48 or 50 gigawatts that is indicated, you know. So, so, so if you think about it, there'll be less than half of these projects that are indicated in in any study in terms of the volumes that are uh, that are likely to come on the grid, uh, you know, from a dispatch point of view. So it would be around about in that order, um, in in terms of what the TDP can uh, capa capacitate. Thanks, Ronald. And there was a second follow up to that. Would stated would it be useful would be useful to see a view of which areas are oversubscribed relative to the present transmission plan. Um, it's not, not They're all overprescribed. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> I mean, so so for example, if you if you if you if, yeah, if you have a look here, so the Northern Cape, the load the load in the Northern Cape is seven hundred megawatts during the daytime. We've got almost thirty gigawatts of interest. The country's total load during the daytime is about twenty eight twenty nine gigawatts. So the single area is more than the entire daytime load. You know, and and you can go down this area, and you can have a look. You know, so 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 when when you look, uh, you know, so when we look at the grid as well, um, the grid is already accommodating the forecasted renewables up to almost twenty thirty. I mean, we gave that indication in the, G, the GCCA twenty twenty five. So um, so it's it's already edging on where indications are twenty thirties renewables are required is already edged into the into the um, into the grid, and hence the grid is congested 
uh, not because it can't add on renewables, but because it's forward sold renewables up to 2030 already into the grid. And and the load needs to build up. I mean, load grows at about 10 gigawatts a decade. So the load has to grow into this to accommodate this, you know, and and uh, and so forth. So so I think it's a combination of, of these. But but generally, um, the volumes that we see in in this um, in this survey is beyond the requirements of any study for 2040. You know what I mean? Um, and so there's a large, I would say, a large interest in a, a much smaller anticipated market, even if even if you can put much higher penetrations in, in into the grid. Ronald, I think we're going to st uh, stop there. Thank you, everybody, for the great questions and to Ronald and your team for answering them so well. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sancho from Sawia for closing remarks, but just for everybody's benefit, you will get the survey link oh, already in the yeah. chat. And um, if you don't, please email either associations and we'll make sure you get access to this to dashboard. Yeah. Maybe just a comment on the um, battery survey. Um, there's an interest uh, from the Battery Association to um, provide more insights in how the storage is going to be used. Um, and they will, um, in the near term, look at how to, um, you know, participate in, in potential survey to give more of these insights, um, but also not to burden the participants with um, survey fatigue. Um, but your, your, your insights would be greatly appreciated if that does, uh, you know, that, if, when that materializes, which will be in the next um, uh, couple of weeks or so. Thanks. Thank you, Ronald. Santosh, over to you for closing. Santosh, I think you're muted. Yeah. You're on mute, Santosh. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. OK, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Zayn, and thank you, Ronald. Uh, apologies, uh, technical difficulties always. Um, a quick sum up of uh, where we've uh, where we've come to so far. So, in the past two years, we've seen the South African electricity market significantly change um, with the removal of the 100 megawatt distributed generation cap and the recent signing of the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill. Um, these regulatory changes can be seen. Um, in the results uh, of the South African Renewable Energy Grid Survey from 2022 to now. Um, we've seen significant increases in both PV and wind, with PV increasing from 35 to 76 gigawatts, more than double, and wind increasing from 30 to 48 gigawatts in contract capacity for all categories of projects. Uh, that is quite a positive move for renewable energy in South Africa. What we have seen from the survey, specifically the mapping of it, is that renewable energy projects in general have become much more spread across the country. Um, and this expanded renewable energy grid survey, which includes information uh, about grid interest at specific sub substations, uh, as well as interest in supplying ancillary services, uh, will provide value to ESCOM uh, in their future planning. What we can see from this is that the future definitely looks bright for renewable energy, uh, as affirmed by the survey. And it also talks to the need for South African energy policies to incorporate the large volumes of renewable energy um, that we can see coming from the survey into our energy planning. Um, we currently have 1.3 gigawatts of wind and 2.5 gigawatts of PV uh, in construction across all of REAP uh, private projects and CNI projects. We know and we hope that the South African Renewable Energy Grid Survey will be used as a source of information um, by ESCOM and NTCSA uh, to continue in their transmission and general infrastructure planning and upgrades, as well as by key government departments, such as the Department of Electricity and Energy and planning uh, in their planning for South Africa's energy future uh, in order to ensure that we have a sustainable and clean and energy secure future. Lastly, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's attended today. Um, Firstly, to the industry for contributing uh, your information and your data to the survey. Um, as we said before, all of the data is contained um, by ESCOM, uh, not by anyone else. Um, as well, we'd like to thank the ESCOM and NTCSA team, specifically Ronald Caswell and Sanjian, for contributing to setting up the survey, to driving um, participation uh, in the survey and processing and presenting the results today.
We'd also like to thank the organizing and executive teams uh, from both Savia and Sapvia as well as Zaid um, for driving this process and ensuring that we reach a successful outcome uh, for such an important tool. Uh, I'd like to thank the other speakers today. And lastly, to those of you who have attended, uh, thank you for attending today. We hope that you do see some value from this. As we've mentioned previously, the results uh, of the survey will be on the NTCSA website. The link is in the chat and we will be sending it out to members as well. Uh, thank you all who, to, uh, who attended and please go well.